Um, I, I, I was with these YWAM guys this, this week, and um, I've been through YWAM. How many of you have ever... How many of you reckon you've sat through at least 200 church services in your life? It'd be most people, right? You would have sat through more than 200 church services. That'd be like four years in church, you know, 200. How many of you have ever been to a conference and you've just like great speakers and yeah, yeah. How many of you ever listened to a podcast? Like you get on your podcast and you listen and you got, yeah. How many, how many of you uh, read a book, a great Christian book from a great, you know, Christian author? To, yeah, yeah, awesome. Uh, how many of you have sat with a friend and had a great conversation around God and they've taught you some things and, and opened your eyes and so on? Yeah, there's, 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 there's so much information out there, isn't there? And, and, and I was sitting there with this classroom and what happens is I speak uh, for five days, they give me a topic and I've got about three to four hours a day that I, I speak and each morning when you get in there, the school leader goes uh, to the students, hey, anyone want to give just a couple of people some feedback from yesterday? What really stuck in you? And what generally happens is the students will open up their notepads and go back through their notes. So I said to them, I said, when the speaker said that, the, the school leader said that, I said this, I said, right, now, every one of you, close your notepad. Don't look at your notes. Because I'm not interested in what I said to you. What was God saying to you? What was God saying to you? What, what's the Holy Spirit speaking to you about right now in this season uh, and, and time of your life? But be, because Jesus said in John 6, 63, he said, The words I speak to you are spirit and life. Now, now the words I speak to you, they might be clever, the words I speak to you, they might come from the Bible. The words I speak to you might be well thought out. The words I speak to you may make great sense. The words I speak to you may even be 100% the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But it's not the word I speak to you that's going to make any difference in your life. It's the word that God speaks to us. Amen? It's what God says to us. So when we, when we come on a Sunday, we're, we're opening our ears and we're listening to whatever the speaker's saying, whatever the podcast is saying, whatever we open our eyes and we're listening to whatever the writer is saying. But what we're really wanting to do is go beyond that, put our spiritual ears up. Remember Jesus said this phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now everyone has ears, right? But he's not just talking about natural ears, otherwise the whole crowd would have thought, What's he talking about? Natural, we've all got ears, we can all hear. But he's saying, I'm not talking about natural hearing, natural ears. I'm talking about spiritual ears and spiritual hearing. Are you listening to what God is saying specifically to you? What is he saying to you? Because life and transformation comes into your world when you act upon and believe whatever it is that he's saying to you right now. I'm amazed some Sundays I can stand up here and preach a message and I just, I've nailed it in my head. I know where I'm going. I know what my big point is, my big idea. And then someone will come up to me and they'll basically tell me what I said and I'm going, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Now, either I'm a terrible communicator or they're a very good listener to God. Amen. And I'd, I'd, I'd rather lean for my own self-esteem towards the fact that you people are brilliant at listening to God as opposed to my poor communication skills. So G Jesus said that uh, the words that he speaks, he said, my words are spirit and my words are life. And if we want to be transformed and changed, we need to understand that it's what God is saying to us that makes the biggest difference to us. We live in a world where we are bombarded with information, amen? We, I don't think human beings... See, once upon a time, once upon a time, the only information I knew was whatever was going on in my village. Remember those good old days? Some of you older people might remember those good old days before internet and, and CNN and Fox News and before, before, before you really had the opportunity to fixate on or worry about what was happening 200 kilometers away in another city, a, 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 a terrible incident that took place there or a, a, a war over in this other country or political unrest in this. Like before all that information was being available to us, we just simply knew what was going on in our own village, you know? And we only knew what somebody might have told us because it wasn't being publicized on Facebook and Twitface and everything like that. And every time somebody did something wrong, they weren't people jumping on and telling the whole world how stupid that person was. 
We've got so many voices yelling at us and screaming at us and, and crying for our attention. But, but Jesus makes it very clear, the only voice that's going to really help you transform and change is the voice of God to you. What is the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? What, what, what is the Holy Spirit getting your attention on in your own world right now? What, what, whatever he's saying to you, it's aimed at bringing life to you. You'll get life from what God says. You don't find life everywhere else, do you? I can sit there and I can, listen to, uh, uh, I can listen to the news one night and when I get up at the end of that, let me tell you something, I don't feel like I've been infused with life. I don't feel like the news has, I don't come away from it going, I really love my enemies more. No, no, I'm angrier at all these people and these nations and all this stuff. And, and I'm, uh, uh, yet Jesus said, the words that I bring to you, they're spirit and they're life. Their life, their life. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come because I want to give you life. I want you to have life, and I want you to have life in its abundance. So I said to these guys, I don't want to hear what you wrote down. I want to hear not what you wrote on paper. I want to hear what, what's the Holy Spirit writing on your spirit right now? What's he saying to you? Because I, I did my six-month training school in YWAM. What's it? Let me, YWAM has some of the best teaching in the Christian world today. I believe that. It's foundational. They're getting, these, these young guys are getting taught topics such as the Father Heart of God. They're getting taught the character and nature of God. They're getting taught about repentance. They're getting taught about the fear of God. All, a lot of things that we don't hear a lot about in, in the context of church. Church, we tend to come along, gather information, and then we, we give it a ticker across, depending on how good the speaker was, whether that was a good one or a bad one. YWAM has this, this, this smorgasbord of teaching that goes, we're not aiming at your head, we're aiming at your heart. We don't want you to know about God, we want you to know God. And so they get this great information. I did my DTS in 1992, quite a while ago. But you know what? I stood up and I said to those students, here's what I've learned in, all, in that time since then. I did six months with some of the best teachers in, in the Christian world. We had, we had guys, Lauren Cunningham was there. We had him. We had Dean Sherman. Some names you may know, some you don't. We had great teaching, great stuff. And at the end of that, now when I'm sitting here, you know what? I remember two sentences out of that whole six months of my life. Two sentences. One of them was Dean Sherman, who, who some of you may know Dean Sherman's spiritual warfare teaching and stuff. Well, Dean Sherman, he's, it, was, it was filmed in the 70s and we watched it on a VHS cassette. And Dean Sherman's there in his safari suit speaking. He's in a safari suit. It was cool probably back then. But, but he's talking about how David looked across. He's on the roof of his palace and he looked across and he saw Bathsheba. And this is Dean Sherman. And I, don't ask me why I remember it. I don't know. But Dean Sherman said, the Bible says she was fair to look upon. I have a picture. Do you have a picture? I have a picture. Am I sinning? I don't think so. <laughs> why do I remember that? I don't know. I have no idea. But I remember it. And the other thing I remembered was a, a lady called Janice Hodgson coming along and speaking on relationships. And she said this. She said, if you, to, to this young group of people, she said, if you are dating a boy or a girl without the intention of marriage, doesn't mean you'll get there, but if you're not dating them without the intention of marriage, you're dating somebody else's husband or wife. <gasps> I never forgot that one. In fact, I said to Jackie when we first started dating, if you can't see me as your husband, let's not even go there because Janice Hodgson will get me. <laughs> the spirit of Janice was all over me. I only remember a couple of things. And, and you're going to sit through 52 church services and you're only going to remember a couple of things in a year. You're going to read a book and only remember a couple of things. But here's, here's what I want to leave you with in the little time we got. I want you to see the value in them couple of things. It's not what man is saying to you that's going to change and transform. It's your capacity and ability to hear the Holy Spirit in that. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you right now? What is he talking to you about in your life? Because that's the space I want to play in because that's where the life is. That's where life is. We're so quick to point fingers at each other, aren't we? Oh, you've got, you, you should, you got this issue to deal with, Jackie. You, you should deal with this. And, and, and Keitha, you've got to deal. I can see your issue. You've got to deal with it. And I'm, and I'm telling you what issues to deal with. And so we try hard to deal with that issue because everyone says it's an issue. But God's not saying that's the issue right now. He's saying, yeah, I agree. You've got issues. But I'm speaking to you about this over here. Come and play in this paddock where I'm speaking. That's where the life is. That's where the life is. 
It's, it's, it's like that, that um, uh, soccer table. I think I've told you about my foosball table I put together years ago for my children. You know what a foosball table is? A soccer table, yep. And of course, being a typical man, I didn't need the instructions. Christmas, I pulled the box open, and I, what I did is I put the picture on the front of the box. I put that there and thought, I'll build this whole thing. And Jackie was really wise. She gave, do you want the instructions? No, I don't need the instructions. I've got the picture. I'll just put it together, you know? So I start putting this thing together. It takes me about an hour and a half. There's something like 93 steps in the whole thing when I realized that when I went back and looked at the manual, right? At that point, I, I didn't look at the manual. I was just putting it together. I get, I get to this point where I've got a bit of wood. I tried to get it into the right space. And all of a sudden, that piece of wood wouldn't go in. I, I'm, I'm bending, twisting, doing everything I can to get this bit of wood in. It needs to be here, but I can't get it in because I've built everything else. So I decided in frustration, I'm going to have to go back to the manual. I didn't want to go back to the manual. I don't want to be told how to do things. I know how to do things. I'm a pretty good guy. I'm pretty smart. You know, I'm an Aussie male man. Don't tell me what to do. But I realized I've got to go back to the manual. I pick it up and I'm looking at it, and I'm up to about stage 87 of 93 steps. But to get this bit of wood in, I had to unpull the whole thing, go back to step 12. Back to step 12. It was unreal. But we can be like that. Our lives are like that. Our lives are like that. We can all look at each other and go, you need to deal with this, and you should deal with that, and you should deal with that. But until I can move on to step 13, I've got to get step 12 in place. Before I can do step 12, I've got to get step 11 in place. And we're all works in progress, and we're, none of us is a finished product, and we're all, we're all progressing through life, but, but the, the thing is that everybody's going to have an opinion, and everyone's, but, but God's the one that says, when I speak to you, it's spirit and it's life. When I speak to you, there's freedom, there's liberty attached to that. When I speak to you, I'm guiding you down the right path. Not just a good path, I'm guiding you down the right path. The spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and life. And here's the thing I know about my heavenly father. I can hear his voice. And so can you. So can you. You can hear the voice of God. I'm not telling you what he sounds like. Although I will say he sounds a lot like Jesus. So if you don't know Jesus, you're probably not going to know what the father sounds like. But I believe this, when it comes to communication, when my children were small, did the onus rest on them to have the strain to hear their father's voice or does the father have the responsibility to make sure that he communicates clearly to his children? Our heavenly father is no different. I go through the pages of the Old Testament and the New Testament and God seems to me when God wants to say something, he's very clear. He knows how to speak a language that his people understand. He knows how to get our attention. So if anyone's sitting there going, I don't know what God is saying to me, I can't hear his voice. No, you can hear his voice. Maybe you just don't know which one is his voice in the midst of the thousands of voices that are screaming at you. But he is speaking to you. He is speaking to you because he loves us as a father. And he wants to lead us to places of freedom, liberty, and life. That's what God wants to do. John 6, 63, what Jesus is saying is, I speak words to you that will take you onwards and upwards. The words I'm speaking to you are going to take you onwards and upwards. I've had some words spoken to me by people that didn't take me onwards and upwards. Anyone ever had words like that spoken? I remember years ago when I was just kind of getting started in, 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 in preaching and speaking and things like that, and God had spoken to me and give me visions and told me this is how I'm going to use you, Alan. And I remember speaking in a church at Redcliffe and I remember at the end of the service, this pastor coming up to me, sideswiped me out of the blue. And I remember him saying, basically what he said to me was, um, you're not Brian Houston. <laughs> I'm thinking, duh, Freddie. <laughs> you know? Of course I'm not, you know? And then he critiqued me, everything. If Brian had said this, it would have this. And I'm like, but I'm not. And he ripped me. And I crawled onto the bus at the end of that, that message. I literally crawled onto a bus with a whole bunch of, of students came down here. to They were doing some stuff in the church and I was preaching. And I crawled, crawled into the bus. I was so cut and destroyed and hurt by those words. And we stopped at McDonald's and all the guys got off to go to McDonald's. And I sat in there. I said, no, I'm fine. I'm just going to sit here. And I sat there just holding back the tears from these words that this guy had. And then he didn't leave me alone. For the next two months, he chased me. 
He chased after me. He contacted my, my leaders. He, he, he told my leaders, you've got to deal with this guy. You've got to go after him. And in the end, after two months, he sent a tape of it. Uh, remember cassettes? He sent a cassette of the message to my leader. And he said, you need to listen to this and you need to deal with this guy. He just was not going to let me go. And I was just, I made a vow at that point. I said, God, I will never speak again. Because my, my intention and heart is not to hurt, it's to bless. And God, if my words aren't blessing and helping, man, I'm out of this. I'm not doing it. Because I'm a nice guy. I like, I like being liked, you know. I like helping people. Who doesn't like it? And I, and I made a vow and said no. And I didn't, for a couple of months, I didn't speak to anyone. Then one day, my leader knocked on the door. And I opened up the door and he said, Alan, this guy sent me a tape of your message. So I felt like I had to sit down and listen to it. And I thought, oh, I'm in trouble now. And he said, I listened to it. And he said, my feedback that I gave to him was if we had more preachers like that in our organization, we'd be doing way better. And, and all of a sudden, these words, you know, these words, I knew that was the voice of God speaking into my spirit. And freedom and liberty came where the devil had tried to bring death and destruction. See, the first use of words even in the Old, in the Old Testament in Genesis, we, 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 we start hearing about words in Genesis 1.3. It only takes three verses before we see, hey, God speaks. It only takes three verses to get to that point. And he said. And the first use of words was not communication, it was creation. It was to create. And words create, don't they? I can say something to you in such a way that it can build you up onwards and upwards or I can tear you down with my words. Words, words have power in the sense that not that the words are like magic spells, but the power is what happens on the inside of the person that hears it. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But let's make sure we're hearing the right things. Let's make sure we're hearing the right things. Um, five minutes. Let me just, let me just summarize uh, 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 three things that happen when we, when we hear the word of God. We have to respond to what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. The parable of, of the sower in Mark chapter 4. Don't worry about going there. I'm just going to throw out very quickly uh, a couple of things uh, from that that, that I, I just want to draw our attention to. And they're different responses, different responses to uh, that word. So when the word of God comes to us, when God speaks to us, right, we have a response that we make to that now now the goal let's let's be very clear when God speaks the goal is always life and life abundantly amen it's always life and life no matter what you feel he's saying to you if he's saying to you come clean about something it's because at the other end of that there's freedom life and liberty if he's saying confess something the other end there's freedom life and liberty if he's saying let go of something at the other end there's freedom life and liberty the character and nature of our God is that he loves us he's for us and he's always got something better for us than the thing he ever asks us to lay down or let go of or get rid of everything he says to us is to bring life liberty and freedom to us so in 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 Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sower I was just reading it this week and something struck me that I hadn't seen in that parable before Uh, it's actually about our response to the seed Jesus makes it very clear he says that the seed the sower sows the word the seed he says is the word of God amen so that seed is the word of God that comes to you when God speaks to you now here's the thing God doesn't waste seed does he think about it if God's word is the seed when do when does God run around wasting his word he doesn't waste his word does he so, so, so I've heard people preach on this passage and go, well, it just shows, though, that 25% of the time God hits his mark and 75% of the time he doesn't. I've, seen, I've heard preachers preach that. It's never sat well with me. And, and this week when I had a look at it, I saw a couple of things. Firstly, I think God's not running around wasting his word. I mean, this is the same Jesus that said, don't you cast your pearl before swine. But it's okay, I'll do it, I'm God. <sighs> No, no. When God plants seed, when God sows seed, when God speaks, there is a purpose and a reason why God speaks. Why is God speaking to you about what he's speaking to you about right now? There's a reason. I don't know the reason. He does. What I, I don't know the reason, but I know the result. Freedom, liberty, and life. I don't know the reason, but I know the result. It's always freedom, liberty, and life. It says in Mark uh, uh, chapter 4, when Jesus is explaining this, uh, Mark chapter 4 verse 15 says, Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. I want you to picture this. Each of these soils, it actually says the seed was sown. Go and read it. Each Each of them, when Jesus explains it, he says every one of these seeds, they reach the ground. Every one of them. It's not, it's, not, it's not a picture here that Satan was like a bird and, and, and this, as the seed was thrown before it hit the ground, he took it. No, no, he says it hit the ground. So the seed hit its mark, 
But what happened when it hit its mark? What was the response? Well, here, this first one, he says, Satan comes, takes away the word that was sown. The problem is hesitation. Some of us hesitate when God speaks. The seed hits the ground, and then we hesitate, we wait. And in the waiting, the devil comes and he snatches that word away. That's why we say on a, on a Sunday morning, uh, if you're here and God speaks to you, I, I encourage it every week. Go and talk to somebody. Go and pray with somebody. Go and do some work with that word right now because I know it's going to happen. You are going to get in your car, drive home, and all the way home, the devil's going to slowly make his way down. He's going to take it away. You ever, you ever be sitting in a service? For, um, I'll use a service because we're here. And you know, you know that you know in your heart, your spirit's leaping, God's speaking this to me, and then you don't do anything with it when you get home that feeling that sense is gone you ever have that you thought no, i'll just get home and deal with that i'll just wait till but god's giving you a divine moment a moment where his word comes alive to you and he says i want to do something right now and some of us we hesitate and the, the, the longer gap there is between hearing what god's saying and then doing what god says in that space i tend to convince myself that hey it's not that big of a deal Hey, it doesn't really matter. And I miss a moment that God wants to give to me. That's the first problem with that seed. Let me challenge you. Let me ask you, is God speaking something to you today? And he's saying, don't hesitate. You need to act and respond to that now. The second one, the second one, uh, Mark 4, 4, verse 16 to 17, says, Others are like seeds sown on rocky places. Again, the seed hits the ground. They hear the word and once, at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root... They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The first problem was hesitation. This problem is pressure. Some of us, we hear from God, we know what God is saying, but there's a pressure on that word. And so we don't act on that word. We don't do whatever it is that God is saying. Maybe it's a societal pressure to not stand on what you know God is saying to you. Maybe maybe it's a pressure from your church. Maybe it's a pressure from family. But it's an external pressure that comes to bear on that word. You know, God has spoken to you about a certain thing. I remember a young man, the Lord spoke to him about becoming a youth pastor. He, 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 he felt God said, I'm going to finish school. He was a very academic young kid, great young kid. And he felt like the Lord spoke to him to finish schooling, become a youth pastor. But his parents, the pressure on that. No, 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 you need to get a real job and you need to make some real money and you need to, and you need, and the pressure got so much that that young boy never followed what the Lord had said and to this day to my knowledge is not walking with the Lord anymore. Not walking with the Lord anymore. Yet God had spoken to him and knew what God had said, but pressure comes to bear on that word. Is there someone here today and you know God has spoken to you, but you, you feel the pressure, the pressure, the pressure. Well, that pressure comes to to steal, kill, and destroy. God's word comes to give you life. And if you'll just stand your ground, plant your feet, and push back a little against that pressure, there's life, freedom, and liberty at the other end. The first problem is hesitation. The second problem is pressure. And the third soil that he talks about there in verse 18 and 19, still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word and make it unfruitful. The problem here is distraction. Distraction. God is speaking over here, but we're getting distracted from whatever it is that the Lord's speaking to us about. He's telling us to do something, but we're diluting our life and we're over here. And we're not doing what he's saying. So we're distracted from whatever the thing is that God is saying to us. Anything other than what God is saying. The worries of this natural world, he says. And they take precedence over the kingdom. I'm more concerned about this see, taste, touch, feel, smell world and and the kingdom is just some distant thing that one day when I die and I get there, then I'll worry about that. But God says you've got a chance down here on earth to play a role in that. Right here. Right here and right now. Think about the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus. You know, and, and, and Jesus actually says to him, and by the way, I love, I love, Jesus didn't tell every rich young person to sell everything. That's what's so beautiful about, about, about God is individually he knows what he needs to say to you to set you free. He knows what he needs to say to you to give you liberty. He knows what he needs to say to you to give you life. And it's going to be different, and it's going to be different, and it's going to be different, and it's going to be different. Sometimes God says something to us, we get so much freedom and liberty out of it, we then feel the need to push that on others. Good heart, because I was for God. But, but it, it won't work out exactly the same for somebody else if Jesus himself is not saying it to them. Huh? 
Kurong's full of that. Somebody had an experience, encounter with God, something worked. And so we start a Christian industry out of it, write a book about it, travel the world telling everybody this is the way it works. And God's going, really? That's how I do it. Oh, I thought I was a little more creative than that. I thought I was a little more intimate with people than the four steps and the three ways and the two. You know, I thought I actually knew people's hearts. And I, anyway, thanks for clarifying that for me. Distraction. Distraction dilutes our fruitfulness. We can only live for so many things, can't we? You can only chase after so many things in a day. You can only commit your life to so many things. You can only listen to so many voices and obey so many voices in a certain time frame. Uh, American missionary Jim Elliott, who was killed in the 50s, um, taking the gospel into uh, an unreached people in Ecuador, he said this. He said, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. He was speaking about his his focus and not getting distracted from what God had called him to do. He gave up all this stuff, but he said, I'm going to give it up anyway at some point, but I can't lose this, and I'm going after this, that which I cannot lose. And then the last one, it says, Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. I even love that, that it, when you obey and you do what God, God says and his word takes root, guess what? The result is still different, isn't it? Some are 30, some are 60. It's not a cookie kind of thing because God loves each of us individually and he knows our hearts. Doesn't it say somewhere in the Old Testament that we're fashioned in our mother's womb? That each of us in this room have the fingerprints of God upon us. The church is not a cookie cutter organization. We're not on a production line. Come to faith, come to Jesus, and he puts you on a production line and just goes, next, next, next. No, he's intimate with us and he loves us and he wants relationship with us. So the challenge the parables present us with is what response are we going to make to the word of God when it comes to you? What's going to be your response? Because in each case the word is sown, it was then the response. What happened once the word went in? That's the point. There are times where we need to act immediately on what God is saying. Don't allow yourself time to be talked out of it. There are times where you can't hesitate. There are times when we need to stand firm and fight with everything, not to give up on what God is saying. We need to not succumb to the pressure. And there are times where we need to maintain our focus and not allow ourselves to be diverted from what he's saying to us for this particular season of our life. The challenge today, which one, if any of these things are coming against you right now, is it hesitation, is it pressure, is it distraction? Is it hesitation? Is it pressure? Distraction? What response do you think the Father's looking for from you today? Let's, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for, uh, Lord, it's been an interesting morning this morning. It's a little bit different than we may normally do things, but God, you have been present. And at the end of the day, that is really all that matters, Father. We, we need you, Jesus. We, we know that life is found in you. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And Father, we, we are grateful for your presence with us. We are grateful for your word. We're grateful for the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us, Lord. And so, Father, I, I just want to pray for each of us in this room today, God. That, Lord, we would, uh, God, we would, we would narrow down our, our focus at the moment and we would ask that question. Okay, God, what are you saying? What are you speaking to me about right now? And that, Lord, we would have a look at our responses, God. Do we need an immediate response? Do we need to stand against the pressure? Do we need to remain focused and not get distracted? But, Lord, I thank you that each person in this room, you are speaking to us because you love us and you want to bring freedom liberty and life to each of us, Father. So we thank you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.